Good morning. It's 830 on Wednesday, August 23rd. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the Environmental Protection Agency hears community feedback on how Jackson's sewage system should operate. Then state leaders and businesses work together to get broadband access into more Mississippi households. Plus, we talk with author T.J. Ray, host of this week's History is Lunch, about his research about how the press covered lynchings. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The Environmental Protection Agency is collecting public comments this week on plans to expedite repairs to the city of Jackson's sewage system. Similar to water distribution, the sewage system has been under a federal consent decree since 2013 for allowing raw sewage to seep into the Pearl River. During the public hearing, Jackson resident Anthony Moore discussed his concerns about the federal government taking control of the city's sewage system. I think it is a mistake for Jacksonians to just sit quietly while our ability to affect who controls our utilities in our city and our municipality is deconstructed right before our eyes. I don't think that we recognize the impact that this will have long term. Uh, I'm concerned about the ongoing operations post this consent decree uh, in this order. I think uh, there is a very clear deconstruction of the workforce here in Jackson. We have to be able to maintain our own water post this order. We have to be able to maintain our own sewer lines. That's the first issue that I had. Uh, secondly, I think there's been a failure on the federal government's part, the, states, uh, the state government, uh, MDQ, EPA. Uh, I am from a middle class uh, legacy black community. Um, it was founded as a black American community and we have been thoroughly oppressed and neglected since its inception. It's not a mistake, it's not something that can be questioned, it's the truth. And I, I have an issue uh, with accepting that we're going to now not have any accountability to my neighborhood through our vote for however long of the period, number one. And number two, I'm not certain that my neighborhood and communities like mine are going to be prioritized throughout this process. Jackson is a medium-sized city, and we have a lot of niche communities that are often overlooked because they don't have the affluence, they don't have the wealth that will allow them to come into spaces like this and articulate their needs. And most often, they don't have an advocate on the part of the government to be concerned for their needs. Uh, The city has put a bypass in my neighborhood that pumps sewage from my neighborhood into a Pearl River tributary, Town Creek, right aside of Uh, Hawkinsville uh, Airport, I live there. We smell the sewage, we've been breathing it in for several years. We called the EPA, we called MDEQ, and we don't think this response is uh, effective or efficient enough. We don't believe that uh, giving Jackson a slap on the wrist is going to allow them to uh, learn from this mistake. They have not been held accountable and taking their responsibility of maintaining this from them does not correct that problem. We want to see that our city will have the capacity to provide us good sewer system and good water utilities. The public comment periods come after interim third-party manager Ted Hennepin was appointed to oversee sewer system repairs. His appointment on hold by the federal judge in charge of this issue now until the comment period is over, August 31st. Many residents are urging officials to consider long-term solutions, such as heavily as short-term ones. Jackson resident Sean Leonard spoke yesterday during the hearing. She tells our Lacey Alexander that living in her home is reminiscent of the Flint, Michigan water crisis. I have raw sewage coming up my driveway. It's been going on now for excess of about four and a half years. So I've reported it to the city of Jackson, as well as MDEQ as well as Region 4 enforcement with EPA. So I am still waiting to get some type of result. And it's so bad that the the storm water, well, when it fills up, the sewer fills up, the storm water goes off, and it goes off into a runoff, and it goes back into our sewer system. There are high levels of cancer right in my area, so I was requesting some different things for the oversight decree to include, which is an impact study of my area. How long have you been going through that? Uh, About four and a half years, four and a half to five years. 
And so much so that the erosion has caused my, my driveway literally to crack up and break. So it's about to be a sinkhole. You made a really powerful comment in the room about how Jackson feels like a third world country right now. Talk to me a little bit about some other things you're seeing in the city that are really making you feel that way. Uh, Some other things, just the fact that we have low water pressure most mornings when we still wake up. Even though they've been fixing on the system, we haven't necessarily seen some of the doable results. It's been a problem with passing just the quality, um, the, the quality level that it's drinkable. So we haven't had drinkable water, I know, in about three and a half years. The erosion is killing the streets. The sewage has just ate away at the street at my corner. So I've been petitioning Robert Graham, the district um, supervisor over there, to fix the streets. He won't. I mean, just the crying. No response from the city government. I, I must be honest, though, I was lucky to have a conversation with the mayor yesterday with the hopes of probably getting some help in my area. I live in the Woodhaven subdivision. So we have been actively trying to petition the government, our local officials, to give us some help. You know, there's 600 homes there in that particular area. The tax base is an average of $3,500 that they pay a year. And we literally cannot get any help, nor do they know how to even find the sewage system in in my subdivision. So it's been an ongoing problem. And so many businesses have had to close down, restaurants. I mean, no water. I mean, water is a basic basic need. So it's affecting the economy, along with the crime, along with the fact that we just, it seems like we live in so, if you drive to one section of Jackson, it, it, it seems really good. And then you go to our neighborhoods or access neighborhoods or access cities, Flowood, Madison, Brandon. I mean, they're up and they're moving. What's going on? You know, I worry about Jackson, and I don't want to leave. But it's almost forcing me to consider other things if need be. Yeah. So after this, when you hear other Jacksonians are going through similar stuff, what's your reaction to that? How are you feeling now that this meeting's over? I feel heard. Okay, but I've, I've been voicing my concerns for five years, and I, even to the EPA. So I'm curious to know, what are they going to do? I have had some past experience in the federal government myself, uh, and it's about making demonstrative change. People are tired. We're tired of paying taxes and getting no representation all the way up to the federal government. So it's time to put up or shut up. This is a great display of conversation, but we need action. That's Sean Leonard, a resident of Jackson. Again, the public comment period ends August 31st. Coming up, state, federal, and business leaders are working together to expand Internet access in Mississippi. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. What's your favorite type of music? The old standards? Country? A specific type of jazz? Maybe you love classical. In addition to Think and Radio Reading Service, we broadcast MPB Music Radio. Listen live to essential and emerging artists from your HD radio, our app, or from mpbonline.org. This is MBB Think Radio. Mississippi is our mission. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Many homes, businesses, and schools in Mississippi have limited access to Internet. But state and federal officials are seeking to help close that gap in coverage. At Bolton Edwards Elementary Middle School, students are getting free laptops courtesy of Comcast. It happened during a rally at the school. Tuesday, Democrats' second district congressman, Benny Thompson, told students they deserve access to the Internet to help them succeed in life. Our children deserve the best that money can buy if they are to compete all over the world with students. So I'm happy to be part of the investment in this effort. Uh, One of the things I do in Washington is to try to pass legislation that makes it possible for our children 
to be the best that it, it can be. The infrastructure and transportation package that some people criticize me for voting for because I'm the only person in the delegation uh, in the House who voted for it is one of the reasons we are able to offer internet service to kids all over the country like they should be. So our kids won't. This is so important because our kids won't have to go to McDonald's or Chick-fil-A to get on the internet. Uh, they can do it at home and it can be affordable. So now that's part of what the Biden administration has been helpful in making sure that a child, regardless of where they live, to the last mile, they can get the best possible education possible and have access to internet at an affordable price. So I'm excited about this day, but as excited as I am about the partnership. The towns of Edwards and Bolton now have broadband access in, that, in those rural areas, and that's the reason for the rally. And also speaking at the event is Governor Tate Reeves. He helped organize the state's relatively new Office of Broadband Expansion and Accessibility of Mississippi. He says Internet access is a major part of moving the state forward and having a better workforce. There's no doubt that we're moving to a, a world uh, that is technology driven. When you think about the number of people out there that have their cell phones, that have uh, access to, to cable and access to the internet, today is a, a wonderful day so that every one of these individual kids, their day of learning doesn't end at three o'clock when the bell rings, right? This gives them the opportunity now to be at home, to take their laptop home with them and continue to learn. And I think that's something that is, is a great opportunity. You know, we hear in a lot of school districts and a lot of schools, the whole one-to-one -one, uh, opportunity. This is a way for these young young people here in kindergarten through the eighth grade, by the way, uh, to have a one-to-one -one environment where they have a laptop where they can learn all day during school from great teachers, but now they get to go home and they can learn uh, and continue to do their work uh, with the use of technology. And the, the reality is it's not just for them to get better and better um, in their um, public educational experience. When you think about the automation that occurs in today's workplace. Um, it, it is truly amazing that these young folks get to learn at an early age uh, what, what those uh, possibilities provide. In the aftermath of the pandemic, the, the state legislature uh, made significant investments in, in infrastructure and in uh, machines such as this in, in communities all throughout the state. And I will tell you, in today's world, our kids are learning more and they're earning more and they're winning more and it's for a lot of different reasons. You think about the Mississippi miracle as it was written in the New York Times. The fact that fourth grade kids in Mississippi have gone from 50th to 23rd in fourth grade math, from 50th to 21st in fourth grade reading. Mississippi is last no more, and we're last no more because of a lot of different things, uh, not the least of which is uh, giving uh, more kids more opportunities for success. Regional Senior Vice President of Comcast, Jason Gumps, says residents in the Bolton area will now have access to Internet speeds of up to 10 gigabits per second, which provides high-quality streaming for multiple users. Mississippians uh, deserve broadband. They need broadband for health care and education. Uh, and I would say to you, this is just, you know, one step. We hope to do a lot more throughout the state and provide our 10G network throughout the country. So 1,700 homes and actually more residents are actually getting access to our service in Bolton and in Edwards. Uh, and again, we hope to build more and more communities that are underserved to bridge the digital divide. It's always a challenge to, to execute and construct a, a broadband network. Uh, but we had great partners that really helped pave the way to make this really a fast and seamless build. All the partnerships that we've had with uh, Governor Reeves as well as Congressman Thompson all paved the way to get us here today. Coming up, an author shares his experience collecting hundreds of news articles about lynchings throughout state history. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On the next Fresh Air, we revisit the legacy of the late hip-hop pioneer Christopher Wallace, Biggie Smalls. Justin Tinsley, author of a new book about Biggie, joins us to talk about Biggie's life in the context of not only rap, 
but the forces that shaped him, including Jamaican immigration, Reagan-era politics, the war on drugs, and mass incarceration. Join us. I like this. Yeah. 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 Today at 3 on MPB Think Radio. From children's education to gripping drama, documentaries to comedy, MPB Television brings the world to Mississippi. With local stories, cooking, health, and music, MPB Television takes Mississippi to the world. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Historians are trying to help put the dark past of Mississippi into context, examining how lynchings are talked about and reported by newspapers of the day. We talk with T.J. Ray, author of the new book, No Legal Defense, Contemporary Accounts of Mississippi Lynchings, 1835 through 1964. He speaks today at this week's History is Lunch at noon at the two museums in Jackson. Ray says some content in the book can be disturbing. The newspaper accounts are in there in chronological order. And like if uh, somebody in Drew, Mississippi, published a story, it's in there. If somebody at the Clarion Ledger did the same story next week, it follows the one from Drew. So it's just a chronological thing. And I, I wanted to keep it just raw information, just what the newspapers <clears throat> the newspaper said, and there's no editing of any of the language in any of the accounts. Uh, whatever words they used, I used. So This is based on newspaper coverage of lynchings then? Yes, it's all, it's all newspaper coverage. What did you find that stood out about the explanation or how lynchings were written up? The Alabama-based Equal Justice Initiative has found that there were 3,959 lynchings of black people in the 12 southern states from 1877 to 1950, with 654 recorded in Mississippi, and that's just recorded. There probably were some that no one ever really knew of or weren't, they didn't keep track of them. What that, you're attitudes? You're exactly right. They're exactly right. So. What attitudes did you come across, or how did they describe it? Well, most of the newspapers were fairly neutral. They they didn't very often take a clear stand on it, but you could see from their choice of descriptive terms that some of them had very bi- definite biases. Uh, and, of course, sometimes newspaper A would pick up a story from newspaper B and have to put a new spin on it. So they made it more outrageous and ran more details and sold more papers, probably. So is it more of a reference book where someone yes. who's studying this can go in and use it as uh, research material? I would hope so. That's what I had in mind the whole time. Uh, it's not the sort of book that anybody's going to pick up and, and just sit there in a recliner and read page after page. But anybody who is interested, uh, there's a good index in it. There's a list of all the ones that I have stories about their names and where they were uh, from and when they were hung or hanged, whichever. And then there is a map of the state that shows all of the uh, the number of lynchings in each county in the state. And I wouldn't presume that map is at all accurate because I would start looking for something and, and give up on it, and later on I would find it and find that I had multiple pieces about the same event. The, the problem was how many different newspapers could I look in to find lynching stories that took place in Mississippi? And... Uh, do you just shotgun start with a year and go through it month by month or whatever? Because if you do that, you're going to end up missing what some other newspaper did with the same story or didn't do with it. How long did it take for you to put this together? Published the other one, I think about 2015. And I already had, as I say, a pretty full folder 
then, but I kept doing it until about a year ago. I decided enough is enough, and if anybody doesn't like it, they can add to it. Set about trying to organize it. There is a excerpt that I'm going to share. It says a headline from an article in the April 13th, 1909 edition of the Jackson Daily News reads, Negro lynched in Yazoo. The story begins, Horace Montgomery, a Negro contract jumper who resisted arrest and made two unsuccessful attempts to kill officers after being captured on a ruse last night, was taken from the jail by a mob early Sunday morning and strung to a tree in the suburbs. Montgomery was under contract to make a crop, which he broke and came to Yazoo City. His employer got a warrant for him and sent Constable Russell to arrest him. Is this typical of what you found as you read through these articles? That's fair. that's fairly typical, yes. Those, the language there is fairly common. It, it, it gets hyped up when there is something really sensational, like oh, rape stories always excited newspaper editors. So they make a big deal about the, the young lady. And, and what, what then becomes important is checking other sources about the same story because – I was reading one last night that's in there, a report of an eight-year-old girl being raped. Well, it turns out that it was an 18-year-old girl, and instead of it being just a black stranger that raped her, it was a black that she had been sleeping with evidently for years. So you you get that kind of distortion. I, I guess newspaper editors were nervous about pinning people down because they, they got to answer to their constituency. What were some of the reasons that you found that black people were lynched? And I would assume men and women. Men and women, and not only blacks, but whites, because there are a lot of whites in there that were lynched, uh, some by whites, mostly by whites, but also lynched by a mixture of white, black people. Really? Uh, And there are a number of stories throughout there of black mobs lynching black criminals. So it, it's not a cut and dried thing at all. When there was a mixed race lynching, who was the person that was being lynched? Were they white or black? Or... They could be either. And you, you, what... can find, you can find examples of black or white culprits being lynched by mixed race mobs. So they had committed some crime and people were ticked off. Right. Was that how justice was meted out during this time? I think so. I'm afraid so. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting editorial in there somewhere towards the end. A newspaper came out to oppose all the lynchings by blacks, that only white people should have the right to lynch people. And uh, that's a very strange essay, I'll tell you. Well, author T.J. Ray, a retired professor, thank you so much for sharing with us. You're going to be talking about your book, No Legal Defense, Contemporary Accounts of Mississippi Lynchings, 1835 to 1964, today at the History is Lunch, sponsored by the Mississippi Department of Archives. At noon. Do it. And I've enjoyed talking to you. Have a, have a great day. This has been.